been here at Las Vegas Federal Courthouse again. We just had a evidential hearing, and um, we'll go over some of the notes that I have here. What happened today? We had a an extra long morning for court. Um, court is over with for the rest of the day, but we stayed in there through the lunch hour and um, was trying to get as much jam packed in this evidential hearing that we could because this was our last day to bring in some of this evidence that we wanted to try to bring in. Uh, it, it did not result in a dismissal like we wanted. That was our goal, is to try to bring enough evidence that the government had shredded evidence, shredded documents, destroyed uh, videos and other types of, um, of evidence that could be used in the trial here or uh, to, to find these, the innocent of these men. And um, we did uncover a lot of new information. And one of the, one of them, one of that new, one of the new information is a video camera. This video camera or video cameras we knew uh, existed for three and a half years. The government has always denied that that video camera existed. One of these video cameras were right across the, the road from the Bundy Ranch and was monitoring the Bundy Ranch uh, during, the, uh, during the standoff back then, during the protest of the cattle gathering. The, the FBI, the BLM, the prosecutors for the last three and a half years has denied that that video camera existed. And today, through a witness, uh, a BLM Fish and Wildlife Park uh, witness, it came out that there, there definitely was at least one video camera. We think there might be two video cameras, but that much we did get out today. And that was new evidence that Mr. Whipple brought out and Mr. Ryan Bundy that the government has hidden for the last three and a half years. Ryan Bundy filed a motion over a year ago asking where that video was, where this camera, where all the, the recordings of this, and they always denied it and said it wasn't there. This is kind of like what we've seen back in Oregon where we was wondering if there was one informant, 15 informants or how many, and the government kept saying there wasn't any or there wasn't that many. And at one point in court, the prosecutor stood up and admitted that yes, there were 15 confidential human sources that were in and about the refuge during the refuge deal during back in 2016. The government again had to admit that there was this video camera that has been missing all these years. One thing we do know is that there were thousands of shredded documents that were shredded and destroyed. Evidence that could be um, prove these men's innocence and that those that this has not been allowed at all in the last prior two trials. The judge did go ahead and deny it again, but gave the defense team and their lawyers a chance to file a new motion because of this video that has been missing this whole time. Um, the, 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 one of the witnesses, one of the ways it got brought out is they said that video got destroyed or the video camera got destroyed and knocked down. They don't know who did it, but it was knocked to the ground and ran over or destroyed. And that, that was one of the things that got brought out. They don't know who destroyed it. They don't know how it got knocked down, but it was destroyed. It, uh, at one point, Nadia Omed, the prosecute attorney that was there today, she told the, um, said, so what if there was a video? And the last three and a half years, they've been saying there isn't one. And all of a sudden, when she got caught red-handed that there was a video, she blurted out in court, so what that there was a video? What does it matter anyway? She, um, she also, Mr. Whipple said, these men have been accused of being domestic terrorists. And this evidence has been hit against them. They've been confined and locked up. It's time to send them home. It's time to dismiss this case. And Nadia Omed again said, Your Honor, I've never said that these men were domestic terrorists. And then she kind of had to backtrack and admit that one of her other prosecution team, like Steve Myrie, might have referred to them as domestic terrorists in the past. She personally has not, but other prosecuting team has. So the it's definitely, we got we proved today that there's been evidence hidden, evidence that has been destroyed or is missing, we cannot find the witness. The witnesses have conflicted each other. 
Uh, last week, the a hearing that I was not in, uh, Dan Love and some of them, I was mentioning again today that they said that these documents were shredded. Uh, today, uh, three of these four, four government witnesses said that they did not um, shred it. They don't know what they're talking about. They never seen a shredder. And one witness finally admitted that yes, there was a shredder in one of the trailers there at the at the wash area and he did not come out and admit that he told them to shred it but he said follow protocol or follow policy which policy included shredding this information in these documents another thing that was really interesting to me the day before all the protesters went to the wash so October or um, April 12th 2014 um, all the protesters went to the wash from the flagpoles of the staging area, the Bundy Ranch. The 11th, the day before, they were all told that something bad was going to happen, all these officers. And if they were not to leave, there was no threat yet, but they were all told they had to sleep there and stay there and camp there. They could not leave. I don't quite buy that. If, if shelter in place was their order, shelter in place, not leave. That's the exact wording that was, that was given. I don't... I wonder why they had a shelter in place if it was so dangerous why didn't they just drive out of there before the danger occurred 24 hours plus later why did not they go back into their hotel rooms in mesquite instead they stayed and sheltered in place when there wasn't a threat and the protesters didn't show up till the following day until about 10 o'clock in the morning or 11 o'clock so it doesn't make sense there was no threat mr whipple asked one of these witnesses that viewed the video camera and they asked them a question. There's some, some sirens coming by, so we'll give it just a moment here. But Mr. Whipple asked one of these witnesses, uh, viewing these videos, viewing this, did, did you see a, a conspiracy against the federal government? This agent said no. Did you uh, feel an immediate threat by watching these videos? And this witness again said no. Was there any intimidation in these videos, such as guns and stuff? And they said no, but it did, it did scare them seeing all the people showing up at the Bundy Ranch. And they just mentioned people and vehicles. They mentioned no guns, no other threats at all, just the presence. And this is like 10 miles apart from the wash area where they're staged at, where the BLM are at, and the Bundy Ranch, over 10 miles. And you got to understand that these protesters, or these people coming to support the Bundys, were not at the wash area. That was just where the cows were. The cows were not even being brought past there. So the, the protesters were miles away <coughs> and this agent, him hauled around and said, yeah, she felt some threat with the protesters showing up at the Bundy Ranch. And uh, but other than that, there was, she said there was no conspiracy she's seen, no threat and intimidation, no weapons. And there is no case here. And that's what Mr. Whipple brought up again. It was a good day today for the defense even if we got denied our motion for dismissal, but we get to revisit this again here in the near future with new motions, we can bring up hopefully this video and find out what happened to it. And how, how, do, these, how do these thousands of papers, uh, documents get shredded? Who shredded them? That still is a mystery. We do not know. They seem like um, we heard a lot today as I don't recall uh, over and over again. So many times I can't even count it hundreds of times from these four witnesses we heard i do not recall they'll ask a name of another fellow agent or who was working under them and they'll say i don't recall i don't know that person's name uh, were there fbi working with you i don't know uh we were dressed in plain clothes i couldn't tell what agency some of these people from or from their uniforms and that's a good point too to make because if a, a blm officer or an fbi agent doesn't know who each other are how do the protesters, how are they supposed to know that these guys are BLM uh, officers or park rangers? How did they intimidate um, these BNL office, BLM officers and, and threaten them if they didn't even know what agency they're from, if even themselves didn't even know? And that was brought up in the last two trials here. It uh, says they, they, they look like military people. They did not look like your normal police officer on the street. And I think the judge was seeing through a lot of this today. Even these other officers didn't even know that these what agencies these people were from. And there was hundreds of these officers there on the ground from BLM, park rangers, Metro, FBI. 
And um, there was no threat here. This case has been a sham from the very day one. False charges against these guys, but it still looks like we are gonna go into trial on Tuesday morning, uh, regardless of what's been presented here. And we'll just see how the case keeps on coming out. But it doesn't, I believe if we can get the right evidence in, this case will not go all the way to the end. It should be dismissed just like it should have been from day one. I appreciate everybody for joining us here again. Let me say a couple of things. Yeah, come on in here, Neil. Just, you know, I have Neil on for it. You know, it's funny because he started totaling up the number of federal, federals were there at Bundy Ranch. They probably outnumbered the cows. <laughs> <laughs> but in reference to this threat thing that the federals were talking about and everything, they never came back down to the actual person who uh, testified or issued to the fact that there was a threat from us. But let's look at the chronology of this whole thing. This threat, buzz, or scare, or rumor, or whatever it was, was spread around the BLM compound on the 11th of, uh, 11th of April. I, I, guarantee, I was right there in the crowd at the stage and everything else, and I can absolutely guarantee you, we had no idea of going to Toko Flash, no idea of attacking the Federals, nothing like that whatsoever on the 11th. There, there was never any talk of any kind of a violent attack of anybody there that I heard. As a matter of fact, we didn't know about Toko Wash or had any idea of leaving the, co of the staging area and going down to Toko Wash even on uh, the morning of the 12th. It was not until Sheriff Gillespie got up on the stage and told us that the BLM was leaving. Then Cliven, of course, thinking about his cows, said, okay, if the BLM is leaving, let's go get my cows back. Now let's look at what this means here then. If the BLM were leaving, why the hell would we go to attack them? <laughs> no. So anyway, we were surprised as anybody. When we I, I'd never heard of Toko Wash. I didn't know where we were going, but we all drove down there. We were as surprised as every, anybody else to see that the BLM was still there. We had no idea of attacking them or anything like that. The subsequent events, of course, uh, everybody knows about. You know. I say we arrived uh, uh, at seeing the BLM there, we got in a rather high moral dungeon, <laughs> I'll put it that way. But there was never any idea of starting any shooting then either or anything like that. We took a big chance that some nut did start shooting, uh, but uh, we had no real intention of doing any attack or anything like that. I Hopefully, what I've described here too also dispels any ideas of, of a conspiracy. And they say, I was there through the whole thing, and it was just the opposite of conspiracy. It was a chaotic, moment by moment, no leader or anything, except to having the, the idea, let's go get the cows. If you want to call that a conspiracy, I guess you can, but that's about the most direction we had in that whole, that whole time. Uh, primarily, the rest of our stance there was simply uh, uh, defensive. defensive. So uh, hopefully this uh, explains a few things, and of course, John's done a great job of... Uh, uh, describing the insanity that's going on in the uh, Judge Navarro's courtroom. I think their their case, though, is disintegrating and falling apart. Uh, excuse me. And uh, there's a very good chance that uh, the Federals are going to see that they're headed for driving off another cliff, just like they did in Portland, just like they did in the first two trials here, and decide, rather than prosecute this case, they want to escape from it somehow and end it before they have another disaster on their hand. So uh, we all have high hopes about that. Uh, Governor, uh, no, Lawyer Whittle did a marvelous, very, very heated, passionate job of pointing out these gross uh, injustices and inconsistency in the case uh, this morning. I've really handed him for doing it. I think the big point he made that I was so impressed with was that if Cliven was leading a conspiracy, they would have had it on video because they were videotaping the yes. area that Cliven was in the whole time. Cliven was never at the wash. I was really impressed Precisely. with that point. Precisely. Cliven never was at the wash. And I'll add this too, as far as the whole gun charges, I've never seen Ammon with a gun. He didn't, he was not armed down at Toko Wash or anywhere else. Uh, yes. Uh, well, that was one of the things that was brought up as Tokpok Wash, the wash area was, was, the prosecution calls it the crime scene. <laughs> well, Clive and Bundy never went to the crime scene. It was yeah. brought up again the day, it was brought up last week, that the crime scene was the wash area. Well, they never had video of Cliven at the wash scene. The, 
videos was of Cliven's house. Was Cliven's house considered a crime scene? Did they have a warrant for that video? Did they have a warrant for the video at the at the flagpoles? There was none. There's so much fantasy about one of the previous trials, one of the federals, I don't know, some federal officers talking started talking about this fatal funnel, which I guess for police is a, a crowded area that they're very vulnerable in if they have to pass through it and there's bad guys on the other side. If they all get in there, they're gonna make a really good target, okay? And they had a diagram of Toko Wash and the southbound I-15 bridge going across there. The embankments on either side of Toko Wash for the bridge do make a fatal funnel. You have to crowd in through this narrow area to go through there. But who was in it? We were! Not the police! Not the federals! We were in it! <laughs> That's, That's all right. I have to say. <laughs> Thanks, Neil. Well, we have no um, no more court until Tuesday. Tuesday will be the first day of, of, um, of opening arguments. And um, that starts at 8.30 in the morning. So that's our next, uh, next day of court. We have the next three days, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday off. Please come down here and join us. We'll be in trial here for the next few months, it looks like, right now. So please come down here and join us. Support these families. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you, and God bless.